Hello, and welcome to the online worship experience for New Song Church in San Dimas, California. My name is Peter Tridey. I'm the chairman of the Elder Board at New Song, and I'm just so glad that you have invited us into your home today. Um, we're just uh, excited to be able to worship together. And, you know, we don't get to see you when we do these online experiences, so the best way for us to know that you're a part of this and that you are uh, interested in what New Song is doing is for you to fill out one of our digital connect cards. If you wouldn't mind going to the website and filling out that card, that would just be so helpful to us just to know who you are um, so that we can, uh, we can find ways to connect either through uh, meeting specific needs, praying for you, or just getting to know you a little bit better. For the next hour or so, um, I'm going to start out by just sharing with you some things that are going on around New Song, and then you're going to be hearing from our teaching trifecta. First, Josh Koya, then Melody Anderson, and finally, Grant Miles Era, uh, our lead pastor. They're going to be wrapping up our series uh, called All Right Here. This is where we've been talking about disorientation and reorientation, and you know we've just experienced so much of that in these last few weeks. And I think they've done a great job of really speaking to the issues that we've been facing. Um, we will then be following that with uh, a new series that will take us through the summer. This will be uh, a series titled Words with Friends, and I'm excited to find out what that means along with you. This new series will be continuing online, just as we've been doing, but we're also going to be doing an in-person meeting. This is going to be New Song on the Lawn. We're going to actually meet outdoors, and this will be a time of worship, prayer, uh, and connection with each other and with our community. I, I want you to know this is not going to be the same as a Sunday morning service. Um, it'll be a little bit different. It's a little bit experimental, um, but we're excited to try it out. July 5th, uh, we will have two services, one at 5 p.m. and one at 7 p.m. We do have some guidelines to follow, uh, so I would encourage you to go to the website and look at those so that you understand clearly uh, you know, what, what we need to do to be safe around each other. Um, we also are requiring registration for those, so please go online, take a look at that, and register to join us for that. We'll, we're excited to, to be able to see your mask-covered face uh, at, that, uh, at that event. We'll also be uh, encouraging you to join us for prayer. Uh, we'll do an online prayer meeting Thursday, July 2nd at 6 p.m. And this will just be a time for us to pray together for that first meeting. Um, it's really important that, uh, that we not only seek God's uh, wisdom in this, um, but that we look for ways that, to, to do things in a new way. I mean, this is a new day and age, and, and we have a lot that we have to to think through. So um, we're excited about it, and we just really encourage you to be a part of that with us. You know, all of this is in pursuit of our mission statement here at New Song. We wish to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, and this is a time for transformation. We have to do things a little bit different, but we can be transformed by that, and God can really work through us. And this is all for the purpose of following Jesus loving people, and doing good. And that's our mission statement here at New Song. We wish to, uh, to be transformed, uh, to, to live out that mission statement. You know, all of the ministries that we do here at New Song are supported by your financial gifts, and we are so grateful for that. Um, I just want to uh, encourage you to consider the different ways the, that we have that you can participate in giving. Um, you can go to the website to learn more about that. We have some ways you can do that digitally. Um, you can also mail a gift to the church. But we're just so grateful um, for the ways that you have already participated and that you uh, plan to continue to participate with us. Would you join me in prayer as um, we consider how we can give? Heavenly Father, God, we're grateful to you for providing for us. And Lord, during these difficult times, um, I know that uh, giving may be more difficult for some people. But God, you've been faithful, and we just ask, God, that you would help us to give with cheerful hearts and that we would do it for the purpose of your kingdom. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey everyone, my name is Josh. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at New Song and get an opportunity to talk on this last message that we actually have in the series that we're going through. The series is called All Right Here and it's a series where we unpack some realities. And the realities are um, this concept of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. And, and to do that, we actually followed the lives of some of the characters in scripture and, and picked out certain aspects of their life when they were in each of those stages uh, to encourage us in our reality as we process through that in our life. Today, I actually get the opportunity to focus on orientation. And as I was preparing, I realized that this was the one that we actually spent the least amount of time uh, focusing on. And the reality is, is that we all find ourselves in one way or another experiencing some extreme disorientation. And so as we process through these messages, uh, we really focused and honed in on what it looked like to be sitting in disorientation and what that process was to, to step into a reorientation. But I think there's actually some real value in understanding our, our actual orientation and what that means in, in our orientation, it's, it's our reality right now. It's the thing that we're experiencing, the way that we're experiencing life currently. And, and there's a couple pieces to that that I want to focus on. And one of them is, is our perspective. It's the lens that was formed by our experiences, our choices, influencers in our life, things that had happened that, that create this perspective in how we interact with the world. And, and another piece of that is actually our value system. It's, it's the, the guardrails or the trajectory of our life. The thing that kind of keeps us in line or the, keeps us in the direction that we're going as far as orientation goes. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about Paul and Paul has a very clear example of these three things, but I was thinking about Paul prior to his encounter with God. And some things that, that struck me about Paul were um, the fact that he was zealous about what he was doing. He was passionate. He was committed even to the extent of life and death choices. And, and then I look at Paul in, in his reorientation and I realize that all those things still mark his life, that he's still zealous and passionate about what he's doing and committed to what he's doing to the extent of even life and death. So it made me ask, what was it that actually changed? What does reorientation mean? And it clarified something to me. And that thing is that, that orientation isn't, your orientation isn't based on your actions, the things that you do, but it's based in why you did those things. And that takes some effort and that takes some, some introspection and that takes like really thinking and mining through your reactions and your emotions and the way you do the things you do. And to help us through that, we're actually gonna jump in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, starting in verse 20. It says, to the Jews, I became a, like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having law. And to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. And when I read this passage, it actually created a tension with this, with this mantra that I heard over and over when I became a Christian. And that was that we are to be in this world, but not of this world. And, and I read this passage from Paul and it seems as though Paul is doing his best to be of this world. These different categories of people, he's making extreme efforts to, to be who they are, to, to be exactly like them. And, and it created this tension and confusion in me. And I wondered why he was doing that. And in verse 22, the second part of it, it says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. 
I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. The why behind what he was doing, his reorientation in this situation, the, the reality of how he functions in his life now is based not in him proving his worth, in him imposing his beliefs and his morality on other people, but is based in him prioritizing other people. And that's wrapped up in the last one where it says, I became, to the weak, I become weak to save the weak. And I thought about what it means to become weak. And that's a posture that the only way to take it is, is to have grace and empathy and meekness. And when you do that, when you step into someone else's reality, you actually validate their humanity rather than address their problem or address them as a problem. And, and it's in this orientation that Paul has, this, this reality and how he functions in his life that we see him interact and go boldly into these things that would really look bad on paper if he were to do. Why is he hanging out with people who aren't holding to a moral standard? Because I was raised with this belief that when I'm around a bunch of people doing things that are bad, I better make it clear that I don't accept what's happening. I better make it clear that that's counter to what God would have. And for a long time, that was the highest ethic for me. That was my orientation. I thought that that was the most important thing to not be of this world meant that. But Paul paints a different picture here. And I think to do this well, it takes some work on our behalf. It takes some work to dig and to mine our orientation, our perspective. When, when something happens, when we respond in a poor way, when, when we get upset, when we get excited, why those things are happening. But if we don't do that, if we don't think through those things that come over us, those emotions, those feelings, if we don't think through where we currently are and why we're experiencing those things, then we're gonna have a guaranteed result and that result is gonna be selfishness. That we're gonna feel forced and backed into a corner in such a way that we need to defend our spirituality or our Christianity, that we need to impose our moral compass on other people, that we actually need to fix the problem of this person's weakness. And we feel the weight of that rather than doing what Paul does and meets them where they're at, walks with them in their reality rather than imposing his reality. But the hard thing with this, when we're thinking about our orientation, is, is that it comes at a price. And that price is that we dig up these things in us. We have to deal with some of the things that we don't do well. And I wanna just give us a couple quick tools to start that process. One of those tools is I've used before, if you see something that happens that causes you to feel angry, that upsets you in a real way, that's a really good place to start because you look at that and then ask yourself honestly why that upset you. Because the answer, because it's not right, isn't enough. Say you see someone being treated inappropriately. It's not just because that's not okay. It's because you value empathy. You value equality and how people treat one another. You value respect. So, so you get a little bit of a picture of your current orientation when you start to ask those questions. Another thought that I had was, was think 10 years into the future, something that you'd be so excited if it was a reality for you. Maybe it's you're, you're out of a certain amount of debt, you've, you've graduated from school in some form, or you starting a family, or maybe you're buying a house. And, and ask yourself why that came to the top. Because if it's buying a house, obviously that's a great thing. It's a wonderful blessing to have. But a home means something different to every person. Maybe that house signifies your ability to provide for your family. 
Maybe it signifies a sense of security for, for you and, and the people who you love. Maybe it signifies an opportunity of hospitality. It can mean different things. And, and to think about that will give you some clarity as to where you are in your current orientation. And we can do about the opposite of things that are difficult or things that we hope don't happen and be honest. And whatever comes to the surface gives us a clue that that might be an area, a pitfall that we might fall into. Some anxiety that's unhealthy that we're sitting in, that we're dwelling on. And and I think that it's hard work and I'm not a therapist by any means, but I would imagine that that maybe this would take a therapist to really do well. But when you go through this process that some hard things are gonna come up, some things that maybe you don't like about yourself, but the result of doing this, the result of, of considering your current orientation in all of this is that it frees you from some of those things that are binding you, from some of those things that are limiting your ability to step into someone else's reality because you're so busy protecting your own. So I would just encourage us, even though it was one we kind of skipped over during the series, to, to in whatever way is best, maybe this is with a trusted person, maybe this just starts journaling yourself, but to, to think about and to process and to consider your orientation so you might steward the gift of your life that God has given you, not just for yourself, but to be a blessing to others. Confused, angry, sad, hurt, worried, short-tempered, scared, Isolated, broken, entitled, checked out, challenged, hopeless, guilty, traumatized, paranoid, doubtful, outraged, frustrated, anxious, fearful, depressed, irritated, fed up, intolerant, withdrawn, unsettled, disturbed, selfish, weary, numb, disoriented. All of these words have been used during this sermon series we have been in that began um, in April, 10 weeks ago in April, and now we're headed into the first week of July. Josh just walked us through a little bit of a sense of orientation, and I get to talk to you about disorientation today. You know, we looked at people in the Bible who faced these very words during their circumstances, during their um, experiences. We saw that they themselves found themselves in great moments of disorientation, feeling all these words and all of these things at one point or another. Elijah found himself in a cave, isolated, depressed. Joseph was in a prison, confused because he was innocent, scared because he didn't know what was to come. Esther found herself looking down a palace hallway, anxious about approaching the king and fearful for her life and the lives of her people. Moses was literally at the bottom of the sea with nowhere else to go. And when he came out on the other side into a wilderness, he was frustrated and disappointed. All of these figures, again, have experienced some of these words at some point or another. That's why we're looking at them at this time that we are walking through this time of disorientation. I wish I could have you guys in here right now. I wish I could have you guys in here so that you could give me a show of hands and say, hey, do you identify with this word? Do you identify with that word? I'm sure that you can identify with some of them. So do it right now. Do it at home. Raise your hand or say a little amen in the comments. I've, I would love, love to see even more 
the raised hands or the amens to the question that I'm about to ask you, which how many of you can identify with all of those words I just read? All of those words. I bet I would see a lot of amens to that. And leading the charge would be me. I would be on the front lines of saying, amen, I have experienced all of those words on all different levels, all of them. I have experienced each and every one of those feelings at one time or another. And a lot of those times it has not been pretty. Can you say amen to that? I've had roller coaster days, ups and downs. I've gone zero to 60 in a matter of seconds. An interaction or a conversation has turned my day sour. I feel like I have flipped faster than a pancake on a griddle. Faster than a pancake on a griddle. And I know, I know I am not the only one. I know it. I know it. I know you're raising your hand in your heart. I know it. You know, I keep talking about my kids, keep talking to my kids about this moment in history. I keep saying, you know, remember what we're going through right now because you're going to tell your kids and your grandkids and this is something that you're going to remember for the rest of your lives. And I've been thinking about that a lot. What will we be saying at this time next year? At this time five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? What will we say defined us during this time? What word would we use? What experience would we refer to? What, what would we say? We were desperate. We were lonely. We were looking down a hallway. We felt like we were stuck in a prison. We felt like we were facing decisions. What would we say? I was thinking about the word I would use to encompass all of these things. All of these things. All of these emotions. And the one word that kept coming back to me was change. Change. Change can mean a lot of things. Change can be good. Change can be bad. Change can be for big things or small things. Change. Now, change doesn't usually have me running towards the hills. I like change. I welcome it. I like to be flexible. I like to roll with the punches. You know, but for someone who thinks she's pretty flexible and someone who thinks she likes change, oh boy, I did not act like it and I did not feel it a lot of the time. I didn't like the change. And I was not okay with all of the ways I have been and continue to be disoriented. I know I'm not the only one experiencing this either. I have felt all of these things and I have had a lot of moments of saying, what the heck, God? What is happening? Where are you? What is happening? I like change, but this, but this, I remember the psalm I read during my sermon on Moses, Psalm 77, the first portion of it says, I cry out to God, yes, I shout, oh, that he would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord all night long. I prayed with hands lifted towards heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed and longing for his help. You do not let me sleep. I am too distressed to even pray. I think of the good old days. Long since ended where my nights were filled with joyful song. I search for my soul and I ponder the difference now. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Has his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? It has not been all right here with me a lot of the time. It has not been all right. But remember what I said, that I can flip as quick as a pancake on a griddle? Remember what I said? There's two sides to a pancake, right? There's two sides. I have also experienced a different set of words during this time of disorientation. 
a very different set of words. And again, I would love to see you in here or love to see an amen to see if you have experienced any of these words during your time of disorientation. Empathy. Humility. Mercy. Compassion. Peace. Kindness, bravery, hope, courage, confidence, trust, generosity, calmness, joyfulness, change. This second set of words is very different from the first set of words. Two sides of a pancake, right? These people in the Bible experience different thoughts, different feelings, different emotions on different days, both sets of words. And maybe you have too. I know I have. And I'd love for you to write down both sets of words. Here I have printed them out. I've printed them out for you to see here. This is the first set of words. This is the larger set of words. This is the second set of words. Which one which one will we focus on when we tell this story in a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Which set carries more weight for you? Both sets of words are associated with change. Both sets of words we can feel at the same time. All these sets of words I read at the beginning, all the difficult, painful, hurtful things, and these sets of words I just read, all the hopeful, inspired words I just read, which ones will you focus on? Which set of words do you think you'll repeat over and over when you talk about this change that we are going through, this time of disorientation? There have been crazy difficult things that have occurred because of change. But there have also been crazy positive things that have come out of this time because of change, because of disorientation. I have seen it in you. I have seen it in our community. I've had it through conversations. I've heard about it through different avenues. I've seen difficult, difficult conversations happen that have resulted in deeper understandings. So what am I going to remember about this time in 5, 10, 20 years from now? What am I going to tell my children, my grandchildren? What are we going to talk about during this time? All of it. All of it. Because this, orient, this disorienting time has been all of it. All of it. And I still have, and I'm going to experience all of it. I'm not immune to one set of words or the other. I don't get to just pick and choose. I am a part of all of it, and you are too. And that's okay. Every day will bring something different. Every experience can flip us back and forth like a pancake. Everything is going to do that to us. But God is bigger than all of it. God is bigger than all of it, bigger than all the ways we flip back and forth. He doesn't flip back and forth. He does not change. He is constant, and he is what we cling to. He is our inspiration. And can I get an amen to that? Hello, my name is Grant, and I'm lead pastor at New Song Church. It's a joy and a privilege to serve here with you all. And it's a joy and a privilege to be able to share this morning with Josh and Melody. I really appreciate their being part of this sermon series, and especially this day as we wrap up. Uh, I think it's really a wonderful picture of the church and how God intends the church to be, to have uh, multiple voices speaking the word of God uh, within our community. I think it's really healthy that we do so. We have different perspectives and experiences and different voices, uh, and that's something we want to continue to grow uh, as we give voice uh, to the testimonies of our people in the coming months. Um, so last uh, week I mentioned some of our goals. In fact, we've talked a lot about these, the goals for the coming year. And one of these is what we're calling uh, 
uh, helping people to grow as devoted followers of Jesus who engage in what we're calling mere Christianity. Uh, and we described some of what that is uh, last week in, in terms of what, 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 what do we believe and what does that mean for life. And so we're going to be uh, doing a lot of work in this area in the coming months. But one uh, very important concept that the mere Christian should believe uh, is the concept of the Trinity. And it's going to hopefully become clear why I'm mentioning this uh, during this wrap-up message. Uh, the Trinity is a mystery, but it seems to be the clear witness of Scripture throughout the Bible. And then it's always been what Christians have believed uh, throughout our history. Actually, New Song's logo uh, of the interlocking uh, shapes is, is kind of a Trinity symbol. Uh, but I want to also share this other s- diagram of, of how we can conceive of this mystery that is the Trinity. Uh, and it's a very ancient uh, symbol and diagram. Uh, there's actually very old parchments that contain this uh, drawing and this, uh, this sketch. And it really tells us that all parts of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are God. But yet it does bring these distinctions to say the Father is not the Son. Uh, The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father. Um, And so there are distinctions within this one God. Uh, There there are these three aspects of God. And actually it's a very powerful concept because so many of our understandings of Christianity and community and what this faith is about are actually drawn from this concept of this three-in-one God. Uh, for example, God is love. <laughs> Before humans were ever created, God existed in love. There's this, this community element to the Godhead. Uh, secondly, God is community. And, and so then we know that God is calling and inviting us into this community of love as we are called to engage with him uh, through Jesus Christ. And as I've been considering uh, this past bunch of weeks about these movements of life, of orientation to disorientation to reorientation, it started to become somewhat clear to me that they in many ways reflect and mirror the the persons of the Trinity uh, that that, that are this one God in in the three elements. And Josh began uh, today talking about the sense of orientation. Way back at the beginning when we uh, began this series, we looked at the Psalms and God the Father, as we considered him then, as we can see him now, is a wonderful foundation to understand that reality of orientation. Uh, Way back, we heard the psalmist talk about that God had created the heavens and the earth and he had set these things in motion and that there's seasons and they come and they go with predictability. The sun rises and the sun sets. And the Psalms are full of these affirmations of the creative God, the God who created things and and things that are trustworthy and predictable. But also in the Old Testament, it's seen that these are actually signs that point to a God who is faithful, who is true and trustworthy in all of his ways. And, and this is perhaps a new concept to you, but this concept of God as being trustworthy and a creation that is, that is good, uh, though uh, of course it's, it's, it's damaged and broken in places, is something called common grace. And it's actually revealed in this text in Matthew where Jesus says that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And it's really the reason, as Josh said earlier, that Paul was able to engage with all these different cultures because they share this commonality of this common grace that is given by God, which allows us to live uh, in moments without chaos and in times of of plenty and of abundance and of, of provision. But unfortunately, people take this reliability and this predictability for granted and even worse, turn away from the God who provides this grace to us and turn toward other lesser things. A melody shared about disorientation and much of the disorientation or the confusion that we find ourselves is as a result of this rebellion, this turning away from the God who has provided such a rich opportunity to engage with him and one another in peace. Um, And we have learned that God is present in these places, as Melody told us. God is present in these places. But we're also reminded in this series that there is a disorientation that is actually a power for good. There is a good confusion. There is a good disorientation. There is a good interruption. Uh, And we describe Jesus himself as the disturber of the peace. So second person of the Trinity is the Father, and then there's the Son. And this Son enters in, and he interrupts us. And often it it appears to us as a a a time of disorientation. Uh, Scripture says that when we were sinners, we were stuck in these patterns, uh, Christ died for us. 
So, so there's common grace that is, that is accessible and, and experienced by all. But then there's this thing called special grace. And it's for all who will turn to Christ. So in disorientation, there, there is a good disorientation that the son brings. The father provides this overall sense of a world where we can experience a good orientation. So what about the third person of this triune God, this trinity? Uh, scripture says we are meant to f- find our life and our breath and our very being in this person of the Trinity. Well, in the process of becoming reoriented, the primary means by which this always occurs, if we believe that there's a God who is here in this world and is active, is by our engagement with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He is not just some emanation from God or some ghost-like force or a specter or simply a spirit. He is God active in the world. So I just want to tell you, hold on to your hat or your recliner or your pancakes or your coffee or whatever, because we're just going to do a really quick dive, whirlwind trip through the Bible about what this spirit brings us in terms of reorient, reorienting us to the world as it should be and ourselves in it as God would wish us to be. So the first thing in the beginning, the spirit was a creative power in the beginning. He brought things into being. Genesis 1, 2, the earth was out form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. This is disorientation. But the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Something was happening. Well, he is still the creative power for transformation now. Paul writes, all of us are looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord. And we are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. And this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And God chose us to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Sanctification is simply um, sacred, making us sacred, making us more of God's own and changing us in alignment with that. Uh, the Holy Spirit brings God into our lives and brings our lives into God. Paul writes, Christ is building you into a place where God lives through the Spirit. Don't you know you are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you? He gives us a new way to live by a new nature. Romans says, because Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And he points to Jesus and teaches us about him, about this new life that Christ has brought. When the advocate comes, whom I, Jesus, will send to you, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And he sets us free, the spirit sets us free from other powers and influences. Second Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. And the Spirit causes us to want what God wants. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And he gives us new voices and new words that speak the truth about God. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same Spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. And he affirms our connection to God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And then he prompts us to enter into new spaces in the world with confidence and love and purpose. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Judea and Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And Paul says, now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. He gives us courage to live sacrificial lives of love and power. Paul writes to Timothy, God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. And he alone gives us hope beyond our circumstances Paul writes, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
And we've been talking about diversity. We've been talking about unity. We're talking about the, the beauty of the multiculturalism of God's kingdom. And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes possible a community that truly forms a place of human unity in diversity. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Make every effort, therefore, to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. And he gives us gifts and abilities for the benefit of our community. A demonstration of the spirit is given to each person for the common good. All these things are produced by the one and same spirit who gives what he wants to each person. And the same holds true for you. Since you are ambitious for spiritual gifts, use your ambition to try to work toward being the best at building up the church. And he binds us together, not, not in no force of coercion or uh, uh, aggression or bribery is connecting us. He binds us together, a unity that we should then protect and nurture. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And then he causes what is happening on the inside to be reflected on the outside of our lives it's called the fruit of the Spirit and it's love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. And then he is the deposit that guarantees what we talked about, the great final reorientation to come. The Spirit is a deposit, a promise, a sign, a foretaste and an instrument actually of that thing that is to come. He set his seal of ownership on us and put his Spirit in our hearts as the deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And we're told we can receive him. To break out of the patterns of this world, we can receive this life through the Spirit. Peter said, change your hearts and live. Change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the thing is, we can reject him at any point. Paul writes, do not quench the Spirit, thus telling us that we can easily just quench this power, the one power in the world that can actually reorient us through all circumstances into something truly wonderful, truly beautiful, truly unique. Again, he writes, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You've been sealed with him. He is present in you. Do not grieve. Do not grieve him. And as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. You know, I think for this whole time we've been longing so much for a settled, a return to a settled orientation, just back to business as usual. And kind of the wonderful thing, actually, because of common grace, the common grace of God to all people, we can find those moments and we can even manufacture them. We can depend upon the reliability and predictability of this world and find joy to some degree. We can find happiness. We can find some kind of um, place where we can flourish. But, but that's really not the point of what, what this is all about. Because... What is the goal really is to truly be changed, to not just find a way to cope or a way to get through each day or a way to just squeeze out some form of joy. It's actually to become who we were made to be, who we were made to be. And it's a process of ongoing change, which requires an intentional, diligent engagement with this person that we call the Holy Spirit, who is God in us acting and working in our lives to change us. You know, I think often we're looking at this time and we want God to bless us. And so often that means uh, change the circumstance, God. Bring me back to a place of comfort, a place where I can feel at ease again. And, and I think often what it is is we're, we're looking to those situations or contexts with more desire and more passion and more hope than we look to the one who could ever give these things. And I remember a song by A.B. Simpson, which is an old song, but some of the old songs have some wonderful truths. And he was one of the founders of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And he wrote the song called Once. And it was about his own personal journey in this very situation where he realized that he was looking for orientation. He was looking for a place 
of blessing and all of these things. And he'd actually missed the point that he was supposed to be looking for the giver of the gifts, the one in whom he was to put his trust and then let the rest of his life be formed around that. Like the scripture Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. But the top priority is to seek God. Is to seek God. So A.B. Simpson wrote these words. Once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is his word. Once his gifts I wanted, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now himself alone. Once was, was painful trying, now is perfect trust. Once a half salvation, now the uttermost once was ceaseless holding, now he holds me fast. Once was constant drifting, now my anchors cast. Once was busy planning, now tis trustful prayer. Once was anxious caring, now he has the care. Once was what I wanted, now what Jesus says. Once was constant asking, now tis ceaseless praise. Once it was my working. His it hence shall be. Once I tried to use him, now he uses me. Once the power I wanted, now the mighty one. Once for self I labored, now for him alone. Once I hoped in Jesus, now I know he's mine. Once my lamps were dying, now they brightly shine. Once for death I waited, now his coming hail. And my hopes are anchored safe within the veil. I want to encourage us this week uh, to press in to the concept that the Holy Spirit is the power for transformation and for reorientation in our lives today. And I think different churches have different emphases on different parts of what we call the Trinity. Some are very focused on the Father. Some are very focused on Jesus. And, and many, of course, are very focused on the Holy Spirit. Uh, but there's an opportunity here to experience both the faithfulness of God, who is the Father, uh, the interruption to our lives that is brought by the saving work of Jesus Christ, and then the ongoing work of transformation in us by the Holy Spirit. The point of this season is not merely to try to return to something uh, that is more comfortable, that, that is like what we have known before. Uh, the point of the season is to be transformed. And, and if we will just be seeking uh, the blessing or the healing or, or the, the pleasant orientation or all these other things that are just are simply gifts from God, then we'll miss the true point, which is to be transformed. And, and really, God is sovereign in that. We don't know yet what we are to become. Um, as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all this will be added to you. But we are so easy to look for the gifts and forget the giver of the gifts. And that's the call of the season to press in uh, with that humility that says, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm gonna seek you with all of my heart every day. And by that means, we will find ourselves surprised by the things that, that occur and the gifts that we are given and the strength that we receive and the peace that is ours and the hope that becomes to well up inside us, even in the midst of the hardest of times, because God is faithful and God has promised he will never leave us, never abandon us, never desert us. And he says, follow me. But we have a choice to not do so. We can walk away. We can, we can let ourselves get attracted to all kinds of other things. And, and we're going to miss exactly what it is that God has for us during these times. And how might we respond if we understand that the Father is the means by which we can even have any kind of settled orientation in life, but we don't want to just stay there. We want to be interrupted, receive the good disorientation of the Son, and then move from that into this life with the Spirit. How might we respond this week in doing that? Well, the first thing, I just want to mention what Melody shared about these words. Uh, we'd invite you to take those words and just ponder them. It is all the stuff, all the things, all the experiences. That is the sphere within which God is working, the difficult things and the hopeful things. Take some time to, to ponder and reflect on those words. And the second thing is, as Josh mentioned, to mine your life, to, to uh, examine uh, who you are and what's actually going on with you. We provided some sheets, uh, which I 
I have here at the very beginning, and I hope you guys have checked them out. It's a means by which, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, with prayer prior to and during, we might be able to see who we are, uh, where it is that we're experiencing disorientation, and what it might be that God's trying to draw our attention to and trying to heal and trying to change. Uh, and, and the last thing really is, is this. A friend of mine once told me that a wonderful practice uh, to connect with the life of the Spirit is to, to consider what are called the fruits of the Spirit, uh, which Galatians tells us are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And to take one per day and, and really focus on that one element. Sometimes we just want to bite it all off at once and try and do everything at once, but to simply get down to the basics and spend the day saying, Father, show me by, the, by your spirit, what is the quality of my love right now? Am I receiving your love? Am I, am I, am I letting that love pass through me and to others? And all the same for the others. Um, we're going to hear a song shortly. Ben Placid is, is going to share a song with us. But before we go there... Uh, and to respond by music. Let's respond with prayer uh, to what we have heard today. Lord, our God, creator, savior, author and finisher of our faith, we come to you again in the midst of continuing circumstances that challenge us deeply and for which we find that our natural reserves of hope and joy, understanding and living are often not sufficient. And therefore, God, at your invitation, we come to you, calling out to you, asking that you would fill our lives with your presence. All that you are, occupying all of the broken gaps and spaces within each one of us and the distances between us that we can't seem to bridge. Give us the resources to live in peace with you and with one another. Father, we acknowledge that you have created this world to be a fruitful place from which we can find nourishment, a place where we can work each day with confidence that the earth will yield food and the sun will rise upon our efforts every morning and then give way to the darkness of night and the rest that we need in order that we can rise again to fruitful labor the next day. You've given us a home with seasons and times that offer stability to our lives. And we recognize by this and by your word that you are the faithful one whose promises are always true and whose character is perfectly righteous. All good things come from you. And we thank you for each blessing, each experience, each person, each relationship, each moment of joy, of understanding, of connection. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Son of God. You have interrupted our broken cycles of living and have shown us not only the depths of our sin, but you have taken care of it all by your living and dying and rising to life. And as we receive for ourselves your amazing grace, we find ourselves caught up into your life together with all whom you have called to follow you. May we receive with joy and gratitude the life that you offer to each one of us. Holy Spirit, you invite us daily to let you rehumanize us, to make our lives each day a growing reflection of the life of God, living with increasing love in our hearts for you and for other people, energized towards good words and good actions in the midst of our communities. Fill us with your presence, power, conviction, and love, and send us out in that power to share the news that there is a new way to be human. Lord our God, all things are yours, and with you all things are possible. Help us not merely to seek your gifts, but to seek you yourself in all the richness of who you are, and thus truly find ourselves changed and renewed and reoriented towards your kingdom. For we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Every
every day We go to war again We assume we know so much more than them Before we hear what they have to say Headline breaks When we start to hate again Calling them names again they see it, cause I want to see it, I hope we believe it, I want to see, I want to see the love all around you, all around you. Day by day, hope fades away, and then we know that there is pain within. We cannot medicate. Learn to feel, learn to begin again. Open our eyes again. They see it. Cause I want to see it. I hope we believe it. I want to see. I want to see the love all around you. All around you. I Well, uh, once again, I just want you to know that uh, I'm blessed that you've participated with us today. I hope that today's message has been meaningful to you. Um, I hope that uh, God will use it in your life to uh, encourage you and sustain you. Uh, I'm also just uh, thankful to Ben for providing some music for us today, and uh, we're just looking forward to seeing more of that. 
I'd like to leave you today with this blessing from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I do pray that you would go in peace this week. Uh, We look forward to seeing you on July 5th. God bless. I want to see, I want to see the love fall around you, fall around you. And I want to know, I want to know the love is all. Oh